I want to say, while you are turning to Luke chapter number 15, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the people that have are listening on the YouTube and the Facebook and the listening over the internet, uh, these messages. I, I, my heart is touched. I am overwhelmed at the good response and the way God is using this. To God be the glory. Uh, I want to thank all of you out there here at the church and all of you uh, that are taking your busy time out of your schedule on Wednesday nights at 7.15 and then on Sunday mornings approximately 11.20. It could be a little early, a little later, but uh, I guess we're on now. I, I want to say I appreciate you listening. I don't take it for granted. I'll try to make it worth your while for, to God be the glory. All right, Luke chapter number 15. Let's begin reading in verse number 11. Luke chapter 15, verse number 11. And he said, the he being Jesus, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and thou wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, thou rose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. I'm lifting those two words, lost and found, out of that verse and entitling this series of messages, Lost and and found. This chapter presents to us as we are engaging in a series of messages from Luke 15, it presents to us that which was lost and that which is found. After all, that's what Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so thus far we have looked at lost one sheep. Verses 4 through 7. This reveals to us the restoring work of God the Son, portraying the grace of God going to get that one out of 100 that is lost. It reveals to us the work of God the Holy Ghost in the lost coin or the lost silver. It shows us that the love of God is portrayed here in this particular message. This was lost, of course, not because of the detachment of sin, but was lost because of the darkness of sin. It was lost in darkness. What a serious matter it was. Because of what the corn represented. This corn, the silver, represented and declared her status. You recall that we told you that it identified her uh, and what, uh, of what she really was. When that coin was lost out of there, it meant when her husband came home that day that it would reveal that she had been unfaithful. And she had not been, but because she had lost that, it's because what it resembled and what it revealed would take place. We found out where it was lost. What a picture. It was lost in darkness. That's a picture of every individual apart from the grace of God and apart from being saved by the marvelous grace of God. It was down in the dirt. Man fell because of his sin. 
And it was in the dwelling, inside the dwelling, lost on the inside. And so salvation has to be a work of the heart, a work on the inside. It's an inside operation that God takes care of, of that sin, pulls us up out of the dirt and the mire and the filth of this world and saves our miserable soul. She sought for that silver intelligently. She sought for that silver intensely. And she lit a candle. Uh, and that candle is not a candle as you and I have it. And in our homes in our day with the wax candle. But this was a candle that was in a can or a container. And it had olive oil in a wick. And so therefore she lit that wick and lit that candle with the oil burning. That was shining in a dark place. Thank God for the day the light of God shined in my heart. Thank God for the day God turned the light on and saved my miserable soul, showing me where I was and showing me that I needed uh, Him and needed to come to Him. And she sweeps the floor diligently. As she sweeps that floor, it's an agitating thing. It's a convicting thing. And so that's what the Holy Ghost does to every individual that's saved. He agitates us. He convicts us. He troubles on the inside and troubles that soul to show us that we need a peace that passeth all under Understanding. And so thank God she not only sweeps and she not only stirs up the dust, but she searches diligently. I love that term, until she finds it. I'm glad today, thank God, he found me. I didn't find him. He's never been lost. But thank God he found me. He found me in the dirt of this world. He found me in the darkness of this place. He found me with a degraded heart, down and out without him, dwelling uh, in Satan's land and not walking with God. But thank God he lit the way and he stirred it up and he searched and he shined his light in my heart. I'm reminded of what Tammy sung a few weeks ago. He came to me. I could not come to him, but thank God he came to me. And so what a tremendous picture our Lord is telling us. And as he's presenting this parable with three different messages, not three different parables, but three messages and three illustrations of one parable. And so he picks it up and we left off where that he looks for the wounded. Thank God he lights the way and he lifts us up with welcome arms. He picked me up. He polished me up and thank God he positioned me. I can see that woman picking that coin up out of the dirt after it had been found with the light shining on it. Her picking it up. The coin couldn't pick itself up. She picked it up and she places it back. Thank God I believe after she picked it up she polished it up. That's exactly what God is doing to his children. When he picks us out of the filth of this world he starts polishing us. He starts cleaning us and praise God she positioned it back in that strange of tin that was tied together with a chain and she puts it back some way or another and attaches it back and positions it back where it should be. I say that's a picture of every child of God this morning that's been birthed into the family of God. God picked us up because we couldn't come to Him. He came to us. God polished us and cleansed us and thank God positioned us in Jesus Christ, the blessed Lord and blessed God of glory. As with the lost sheep being found brought joy, so with the the silver that was rejoicing and the lost sheep that was one out of a hundred that saved and lost uh Coin, that's one out of ten that's positioned. And then today, as we look at this particular passage of Scripture, we turn our attention to the masterpiece, I believe, of all Scripture. We turn and look at this Scripture that I read to you this morning as the Savior reveals what this story is all about. I call your attention back to chapter 15, back to verse 1 through 3. This is what the whole story is about. It says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners, for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes remembered, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake, look at this, not these parables, it says this parable, singular. He spake this parable unto them. Who's the them? Anytime you see the word them in the word of God, look and see who the them is. Here's the publicans and the scribes, the sinners and the Pharisees. So this is who he's speaking the parable to. And he begins to unload on them and make lay this masterpiece out as only he could. And so remember, he's talking now to this bunch of Pharisees and these scribes. Lost as hell itself. In Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32, 
we see lost and found one son. In this parable, in this message, there is one out of two. You see how God brings it down and how God begins to lay it out and God begins to get us to search our heart and to see what we really need. I remind you that the sheep was lost out of sheer ignorance, wandering away, directing away from the flock, just out of ignorance, not knowing it was lost, not knowing where it was gone, but out of ignorance. The silver was lost out of sheer callousness, because it was not tightened and because it was not checked, but because of a careless move and a careless act, that silver was lost. But I remind you today that we will see the sun is lost because of deceitfulness. He's been deceived. He thinks something's out there that's not. He thinks there's a better life. He thinks that there's greener grass on the other side. He wants to get away from the authority. He wants to get away from the life that he's lived. And he's living in a tremendous life. He's got it made, thank God. Servants are waiting on him. The meals are prepared for him. His father loves him. And as an individual, it's not mentioned in this story, but it goes without saying, his mother loved him. There's a mother that wondered where he was at. There's a mother that cared for him. Just because the scripture does not say does not mean that he didn't have a mother because I am absolutely positive of this. He had a mother. Although it's not said uh, that she's here, I believe she was. I believe it's left undone for a reason. That's God's business and we'll leave that where God leaves it. But anyway, we see this son here is lost because of the deceitfulness of sin. And so perhaps before us is the best known story in all the world. As I read these verses to you this morning, lost and found, one son pops up and we see the lost condition of this boy. It is not without justification that has been, that this has been called the greatest story ever written or the greatest story ever told. Remember who's telling the story. Remember who's giving the facts of the story. Remember who's bringing this down so that we can understand this. And he's telling the story to this crowd before him. Upon reading the story, we become arrested in our soul. Upon reading the story, we become interested in what's being said. Upon reading the story, we become challenged in our own heart. There is a homeness about the story and there is a humanness about the story. There's not one person in this congregation or not one person that's listening to me uh, by way of internet this morning or way of the YouTube. There's not one person that cannot identify with this story if you are true to yourself. That's where we were. That's where God found us. I remind you, and we'll get to it a little later, I remind you that in this part of it, in this part of this parable, this message of the parable the son arises and has his responsibility portrayed after the sovereign act of God has taken place the first two that uh, it could not come to him the first one did not seek him he went seeking after it but now the son seeks after the son thank God has been revealed to himself of what he is for the Bible says he came to himself I'm glad anybody that comes to the self and see the self for what they are for where they they are and why they are. Thank God there's a wonderful God and glory that will not turn you away but will come to where you are. He will seek you out and He will save your miserable soul. I'm thankful thank God although we've been deceived God will remove that deception. God will give us truth. God will replace it with that which is right. God will replace it with the light of God and God will take us unto Himself. And so we see the story that's before us is very interesting. It tugs upon my heart every time, Brother James, I read it. Every time I see the words and do word studies and look at the picture that this portrays, it tugs at this old wicked heart. It tugs at this deceitful heart. It tugs at me knowing that I am what I am by the grace of God. God didn't have to get me out of the hawk pen of this world. God did not have to lift me out of the stench of this world, but He did. Thank God for the grace of God. Thank God for the mercy of God. God. Thank God for the goodness of God. Thank God for the God of glory. Thank God for the God that didn't leave me where I was but came to me. I'm glad this morning to report to you he's still in the saving business. Lost and found one son. He's a God this morning that will do what he says he will do. And so it tugs at my heart. There's a sadness in this story. Sure it is. 
There's a tragedy in the story. Sure it is of what happens. This story is relevant and is up to date for us today as when it was told over 2,000 years ago. It's like the Savior has pulled up a chair and sat down and called us at Calvary Baptist Church and has presented to us the story of this prodigal son. And he's presented to us in such a manner. Thank God that he wants to get our attention and to say, you couldn't come to where I was, so I came to you. But because I came to you, you can come to me. Because I've taken the initiative and because I've shown you what you really are and because I'm telling you what you need, I'm not going to turn you away. You can call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that I know of not. I will do for you which no one else can do. And he has and he did. So this is the story uh, here spiritually of every soul in the world before they're being saved. This story has three chapters in it. I was going to read all three of them to you today, but I can see right now we won't get but just chapter one. Chapter number one of the story, I want to call the alienation of a live son. The alienation of a live son. The occurring word found throughout this whole story is two words, lost and found. Lost and found. I believe this is the interpretation of the parable. I believe that it's interpreted that Jesus is painting a picture of that which is lost. He's talking to scribes and Pharisees. He's talking to people, and let me say this to you. <laughs> Hypocrites and Pharisees didn't die out in Jesus' day. And so he's talking to a bunch of hypocrites. He's talking to a bunch of Pharisees. He is talking to a bunch of know-it-alls. And yes, he's talking to people that know what they are. But it's four groups of people that he's talking to. And so we can apply it, of course, to a backslider. I, you can preach it each way. But the interpretation, I believe, as a man of God and rightly dividing the word of truth, staying true to the first mentioned principle and staying true to what the story is all about is that of a lost person. You say, but the boy was in the house. Sure was. We are all God's children by creation. That knocks evolution in the head. I don't give a flip if you're a teacher. I don't care if you're a principal of a school. I don't give a flip if you've got 50 doctor's degrees claiming to be smart in Scripture. If you believe anything other than God is a creator, you are straight out of hell. Amen. God is the creator. God created this outfit. God did not have us evolve. Some people look like they did, but I want you to know the Scripture says that we were created beings. God is the Creator, and as the Creator being, we are all God's children. It's not Mother Earth. It is not Father Moon. It is not this or that. It is God the Creator. As the Creator, we are His children as the created one. But in order for you to go to heaven, you have got to have the spiritual birth and be birthed into the family of God for Him to be your spiritual father. So the picture here is of creation. Adam was in the house. Adam was in the garden. Adam was God's. But he fell. And so he left the garden. Can you imagine what it must have been in that garden? Could you imagine that the fruit and of the fishing? Could you imagine of all the beauty? I don't know if any of you have ever been to Ken Hand's the creation thing up at the museum in Kentucky. But if you ever get an opportunity to be well worth your trip, to go through that museum and see they got the creation aspect there, they got the fall, they've got the whole thing going through there, it is a wonderful trip biblically and scripturally. If you ever get to go see that ark, I, I'm not giving them a promotional aspect and whatever, I don't get a dime out of this whatsoever. But if you ever get a chance to go to that ark, it would be well worth your trip. Plan your vacation. Plan your days. Just don't be gone on Sunday. Just plan your vacation. Uh, and to go to that ark and spend a day at the ark and a day at the museum, it will be well worth your trip and your money to go see that.
I believe it's as close as we can get to the Bible. And they've got that creation with the beautiful garden. And then you go a step further in the fall. I'm going to tell you, I praise God today. Hallelujah. That God can take that which is ugly and make it beautiful. God can take that which is down and pick it up. God can take that which has nothing in and of itself and make something out of it. That's the God we serve. That's the picture we see here. This boy is alienated as a live son. He had life. He was living at home. He was there. And boy, he had everything life had to order. According to the servants and according to what this father gives them at that festive celebration that they have, according to that, thank God, they were well off. They believed in eating filet mignon. And praise God, they had a meal. They killed a fatted calf. and Got in on it. That word fatted, I'll get into that in detail. It means it was put up on purpose. This father never lost hope. I'm glad God never gave up on me. That this father looked, start looking the day that boy left and kept looking until the day he returned. I'm glad when I was out in hell and living in sin and rotting as hell itself, didn't give God a thought and was wicked as they come, doing everything under God's heaven I could get by with. God never gave up on me. God still come a looking for me and God still done a work in me and God still picked me up although I was alienated from him. Thank God he brought me back and did that for me which I could not do for myself. And so there's a spiritual sonship that comes as a result of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. So yes, by creation we are all God's children. But by the spiritual birth, we are birthed into God's family, in the family of God. And you must be born again to get in that family. You must be saved by the grace of God to get in that family. In order for you to have throne rights, in order for you to come to the throne of glory, in order for you to come to God and talk to Him, you've got to be His child. And that gives you a right to come into the throne and talk to Him. And so the natural sonship is clearly taught. It traces man back to the creation of Adam. This shows us our alienation from God because of sin and why men die. But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wherefore it's by one man sin in him to the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And so this shows us our alienation from God because of that sin. Death by sin. It seems to me that there's three steps that lead to this sad separation in the story of this boy that's before us. I'll give you these and we'll go to the house and I'll read chapter 2 next week. But the first chapter in this boy's story in the first chapter in this boy's book as our Lord is writing it he pins it down. In the alienation of a live son, we see in verse number 12, there was the reason for the separation. There was a spirit of ingratitude. Look at verse 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of goods that falleth to me. And he delivered unto them, not him, them. The elder son got two-thirds, and the younger got one-third. Boy, he was cutting his nose off to spite his face. And so he's alienating himself now. And it's very evident according to what I get out of this verse. You can get what you want out of it. But what I get out of this verse, he's showing ingratitude. He is unthankful. And so here, every breakdown we see. And as a pastor for over these 45 years and preaching 50, I have come to the conclusion That every breakdown in the home, every breakdown in the church, and every breakdown will start with a spirit of ingratitude. A spirit of being unthankful. Some of you children sitting here this morning, look at this preacher. You listen to this preacher. You are not thankful for your mom and your daddy. You show them ingratitude by the rebellious acts and the rebellious ways and your walks and the things. you got a know-it-all spirit. And you're listening, you're listening to an old man of God this morning has been where you are. I've been where you're sitting. 
I've walked the path you're walking. I've had a daddy that loved me, a mama that loved me. I had a family that took care of me, but I knew it all. I was rebellious as hell itself. I didn't want them to tell me anything. I wanted to get out on my own. I didn't want to be under the roof of God of my parents. I did not want that. I wanted my own life. I wanted. Daddy said, "Have at it." And so I had at it. And it won't long before I was there. Today. I said, "What have I done?" But unthankfulness and ingratitude and being unthankful for the things of God. Being unthankful. It's a serious thing to be unthankful and ungrateful. This boy is sitting at the table. We know that because they sat at another table. This boy is sitting at the table. This boy is clothed with the, with the robe of righteousness, the, of, of white. This boy has shoes on his feet. But when he comes back home, he has no robe. When he comes back home, he has no shoes. When he comes back home, he's a destitute. When he comes back home, he squandered his life of living. I don't know how long he lived in the hog pen. I don't know how long he was out in the world. I don't know how long he had so-called friends. But I don't believe it was too awful long. But one thing we know the starting of this thing is with every person on the face of this earth, whether you want to realize it or not, to be ungrateful, to be unthankful is a sin. And so this boy was, it was unthankful. He didn't show gratitude for what he had. Calvary Baptist Church, you are listening to an old man of God this morning. You are listening to a Baptist preacher that loves God, that's been called of God, forgiven of God. And I'm going to tell you, I'm so thankful this morning that he's given me a church that I can come on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and I can come to this pulpit and look over this congregation and most of the time a full congregation and look at this congregation and thank God I've got people to preach to. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for every one of you here. I'm thankful with all the hell you put me through and all the ungratefulness that you have and all the things that you don't realize you have and all of that stuff. I'm still grateful for you. I love you and I'll do what I can to help you and be there when you need me. I am not a babysitter, but I am your pastor and I am your shepherd and I will fight for you and I'll stand for you. Don't take... This pulpit for granted. I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. You know me better than that. And you listen to me know me better than that. I am what I am by the grace of God. But don't take preaching for granted. You could come in here and it'd be red curtains and black curtains and smoke coming from the pulpit. In a pulpit not being here. And I stand up here with one little hair showing and an open shirt with holes in it with my knees knocking with the Bermuda shorts and the sandals on. And wouldn't that be a sight now? And you could have to listen to some monster like that. And they give you a little story and not preach about the blood. Not preach about the Bible. Not preach about Jesus Christ. Not preach about what God's done for you. And tell you that old junk that's going on trying to get you away from serving God. But by the grace of God, I promise every one of you this morning, thank God by the grace of God, I'll preach this book if hell freezes over. I'll stand on what God says if hell freezes over. I'll tell you the truth no matter what others say. I want to tell you right's right and wrong is wrong. And God's given us the inspired word of God that we can live it we can love it we can lift it up and we can exhort one another with the exhortation of God don't take for granted what God's done for you I'm not bringing up the past I'm just making a statement here and I'm going to go on to the next point this COVID was straight out of hell in one aspect. In another aspect, it was sent straight from heaven to reveal of what people are really made up of, and whether you're real or whether you're not. It don't take much for you to put on a front. It don't take much for dead fish to float down the stream together. But you've got to be alive with your tail wagging, well, not your tail, but the fish tail. We're, 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 uh, we're going to go, to go up a stream. I'm not taking for granted this book. I'm not taking for granted the blessings of God. I'm not taking for granted good health. I'm going to tell you my health has gone down, but thank God it's got a long ways to go before it gets me down. And I'm thankful, hallelujah, for what God's done for me. 
I don't take it for granted now, good hell. I don't, I don't take, boy, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of God when I can sit down at my table and, and gulp me a Dr. Pepper down. They don't burn. I'm thankful, hallelujah to God, for where he's brought me from and what he's doing. I bless his name. I'm thankful for the church. I'm thankful for the conviction. I'm thankful for the conversions. I'm thankful for what God's doing. Bless his name. And what I'm trying to say, this boy, his life started out with a life of ingratitude. Not only is it ingratitude, it's an alienation, alienating him from, from this, for this life son from God, from his house. But that's a spirit of insensibility. Look at verse 13. In verse number 13, he's insensitive. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. I wonder if he ever thought about how his daddy was going to feel. I wonder if he ever thought about how, although his brother is a, a royal, you know what, and we'll see that. I wonder if he ever thought about what his brother was going to think. I wonder if he ever thought about what his dear old mama, one of how many nights his mama cried over him. One of how many nights his mama prayed over him. Wonder how many nights his mama would go to the window, go to the door and go to the field and look, said, maybe tonight, maybe tonight. But he didn't care about that. He was insensible. He had no, no sensitivity whatsoever. He didn't care how much he hurt his mama. He didn't care how much he hurt his daddy. He didn't care that it had been laid to him on a platter and he'd been taking care of them and had a roof over his head, clothes on his back. He didn't care about her. He was insensitive to that. I want to run my own life. I don't want authority over me. That's what's wrong with Baptist people in our churches. They don't want any authority over them. Insensitivity. Insensibility. A lack of concern. An awareness of not being moved emotionally. Indifferent. Don't care. In ungrateful. Ingratitude leads to insensibility. This is where the death took place. This is where he died. This is where the separation started. Ingratitude. That's where yours will start. Insensible. Showing no sensibility whatsoever. And it took place in the family relationship. Later on, the father would say, My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. This happens to in the Garden of Eden. They wanted their own life. They wanted their own way. At the moment that they took their own way and partook of that fruit, they died for the wages of sin is death. The day that thou eatest thou of, thou shalt surely die. And I asked you a question. Did they die? They did. They died spiritually. And they began dying physically. And so there's a sense in a, this alienation of a live son. There's a spirit of ingratitude. There's a spirit of insensibility. And notice it says he got it all together and took his journey in two. Look at those next three words. A far country. And thou wasted his substance with riotous living. And so here, this insensibility takes place. Ingratitude, follow me now, and I'll be done with this next one. Ingratitude leads to insensibility. Insensibility leads to, verse 13, irresponsibility. He wanted no responsibility. He goes into a far country. I'm afraid that's where many of God's children are in this day. They are in a far country. And the moment that you have an, a spirit of ingratitude and a spirit of insensibility and a spirit of irresponsibility, you are living in the far country. Oh, you may be sitting on the pew, but you are in the far country. Oh, you may be thinking you're spiritual, but you are in the far country. And therefore, you are alienating yourself from the love of the Father, from the goods of the Father, from the protection of the Father, from the program of the Father, and from the penalty of the Father. He wanted to break with all the limitations, with all the regulations, with all the traditions of his father's home. No longer willing to submit to law and order. This was a spirit of irresponsibility. So the Savior emphasizes this in two little words. What is that, preacher? Far country. Shall your Bible say that? Into the far country. The boy was not just getting away from home. 
He was making sure, according to this word, he was getting far away from home. He was putting a lot of distance between authority and responsibility and that which was right. He was going far enough to be unwatched. And what you do when you are unwatched is the real you. He was going far enough not to be controlled. He wanted to be unwatched, uncontrolled, and unsupervised. Kevin Cusack told me 20 years ago, he said, Preacher, the generation that we're living in today, he said, is a generation of no discipline. He said, when I stop a vehicle and I walk up to that door, before they open their mouth, I can see they're ungrateful, they're unthankful, think the world owes them a living, and they have no sense of authority, and they want no one with authority over them. The spirit of in- irresponsibility is the very essence of sin. It is the rebellion against the law of God. Let us remember that without law, there is no life. And without life, there is no love. And without love, there is no loyalty. And without no loyalty, there is no liberty. The whole universe is dependent upon law. It's the law of gravity. What is that, preacher? What goes up, coming down. You can't defy that law. Or you can tie strings to it and all that stuff. But the law, it's a natural law of gravity. If it goes up, it's going to come down. The whole universe is dependent upon this law. But the tragic thing about all this is everything in the universe obeys God except man. Let me ask you, do you sense a spirit of ingratitude? Come on to the piano. Do you sense a spirit of ingratitude? Do you sense a spirit of insensibility? Do you sense a spirit of irresponsibility in your life? I'm talking about a practice of that. Not every once in a while, but a practice of that. If you do, you are alienated from God. And if you are alienated from God, you're without Christ. And if you're without Christ, you are lost. But the good news about it, thank God you can be found. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Without Christ. It's a sad chapter indeed. But the next chapter we'll look at next week in his life is even sadder. Can it get sadder? Oh, it does. But thank God I can tell you the last chapter it gets gladder. (laughs) I don't have to stop with these chapters. I can stop this morning, but I can pick up the next chapter next week. And it's a sadder chapter we look at the degradation of the lost son. Oh, my, we'll deal with the far country. Father, I want to thank you this morning so much. So much, dear Lord, for watching over us, protecting us, taking care of us, for the good, sweet liberty you've given us in this place. I pray if it be one that's lost and undone without you, Lord, they are in the far country for sure. I pray that they would come to you, God, that you, you, you sought them out. You'll seek them. You'll save them. Their responsibility is to believe you. You've done that work. You revealed yourself. You've come to where they are. Now may they come to themselves and arise and go to the Father. For that child of God that may be backslidden this morning, that may be on the edge of the far country, that may be headed to the far country, for all of us today that may have a little spirit of ingratitude, forgive us for being ungrateful. For whatever we need to come to you about, may we confess it, forsake it, and get rid of it while he's playing it. While Brother Mike, if you'll come. Pick us out a hymn of Have Thine Own Way, Lord, I think would be good. We'll stand and we'll sing that hymn. And may God have his way in your heart and your life. May everything that we do bring honor and glory to him this day. 
The altar is open. And may God's people cry out to the God of glory. Whatever the need may be, may they come to thee. We'll praise you in advance in Jesus' bloodstained name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. They're getting the number. I'm sorry I threw that on you. What page number is it? Page 306. We haven't done this in a while. I think it'll be appropriate to do it. You just mind. We just sang the first and the last verse. If nobody comes, we close. <laughs>